Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. So how about those viruses? So hot right now, right? Everyone's talking about viruses. You know why we're in the midst of a quarantine global pandemic with the novel coronavirus leading to the COVID-19 disease. But here at Mindscape, we're less about the concerns of the moment and more about the big picture issues that are going to last for a very long time. So let's talk not about this particular pandemic, but about the idea of viruses more generally. And there's probably no more expert person to talk to than today's guest, David Baltimore, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for virus-related activity back in the 1970s. He and his collaborators were the ones who showed something called reverse transcription. You might know that in genetics, in uh, cellular biology, there's something called the central dogma that says that DNA stores information, RNA goes over the DNA and gets assembled in a way that can pick up that information, and then the RNA carries it over to be converted into proteins. That's the central dogma. The DNA stores, the RNA carries, and then proteins are constructed. So reverse transcription, as discovered by Baltimore and others, shows how RNA can actually go and affect the DNA. In fact, it turns out that in viruses, unlike in every other kind of information-carrying organism, I don't want to say living organism because there's a debate about whether viruses are alive or not, but let's just say that the back and forth between DNA and RNA and proteins is extremely rich inside viruses. And as Baltimore went on to show, this has important implications for things like how viruses can cause cancer, specific kinds of viruses like the HIV virus. And indeed, right now, when you talk about different kinds of viruses, you'll probably refer to the Baltimore classification of viruses, which is named after David, not after the city of Baltimore. So for most of this episode, we talk about what viruses are. Are they really alive? How do they interact with organisms, with genomes? How do they hop from one kind of organism to another? But then we do, at the end, get a little bit more specific about the current coronavirus and also about some bigger picture questions about gene editing, about... Uh, the origin of consciousness. And I asked David a little bit about what he thinks about how coronavirus has impacted us and how we should be responding to it. Let me just say that he has strong words for how we've been responding to it and how we could do better. Not necessarily about, you know, social distancing or anything like that, but how the public health infrastructure should be ready for things like this. In this day and age, this should not be taking us by surprise. So this is one of those episodes of Mindscape, which is both very interesting, but also very important to things going on right now. That's a rare thing. That's usually not what we do around here, but I think it works in this case. So let's go. David Baltimore, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. So I really want to talk about viruses as a concept, right? I mean, this is part of what I try to do here at Mindscape is to really dig into some of the details. But we'd be remiss to not mention the elephant in the room. We're having this conversation during a kind of quarantine for a pandemic because of a virus. I mean, why don't we whet the audience's appetite by putting the this novel coronavirus into context like is this virus that we're fighting against right now is it typical is it surprising is the kind of thing that we should expect going forward well i think each virus is its own set of surprises viruses really only have in common that they're not cells uh, they can't make their own proteins they can't make their own energy so they have to be inside a cell in order to reproduce themselves, but that's a pretty minimal requirement. Uh, And so there are lots and lots of ways that that requirement is met uh, and and lots and lots of different kinds of viruses. Uh, The present virus that we're seeing, uh, we've never seen on this scale before. uh, And we hadn't done a whole lot of work on the class of viruses previously, we, the scientific community. So it, a lot of it's coming as a surprise to us. Yeah. But the fact that a virus can be this surprising 
is itself not surprising. <laughs> I got that impression in my very brief reading up on viruses before this conversation. Oh my goodness, what a mess. Like viruses are just much messier than the entire rest of life or even you know what, what we know is life. Virus, we're not even sure whether we should call it life. Well, I've always been comfortable calling viruses life uh, because they evolve, they, they do everything that living systems do. The only thing is they have to be inside a cell to reproduce. Maybe that's worth uh, getting straight for people who are complete beginners here. Probably nobody is at this stage of the quarantine. But um, I think a lot of people don't even know the difference between a virus and a bacteria. They're little germs that make us sick. Right. Uh, I've, I've certainly seen that a lot of people don't know the difference. And bacteria are cells that are completely self-sufficient. So if you give them nutrients like you put them on a piece of fruit or a, 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 another source of energy, they can absorb that energy and grow, multiply, become many skillions of bacteria. Mm. And a virus can't do that. Uh, a virus has to get inside a cell. It could be a bacterial cell. So there are bacterial viruses. But the ones that we care most about are, are viruses that affect humans. And they affect humans by getting inside human cells, skin cells, gut cells, lung cells, all the various kinds of cells in the body. Many, many of them support viruses. Right. And so one of the ways in which viruses are not like other parts of life, uh, there's no cell wall, right? I mean, there's, there's no inside and outside to a virus. Well, there is an inside and an outside. It, outside, it's got a, a sort of rigid shell of some kind, not always very rigid. Um, and inside, it has genetic material, right? which is its secret, uh, the, the code to make more virus. Uh, and that has to be liberated from the shell uh, and get inside the cell and act like the cell's information, but basically supplant the cell's information so that the cell now becomes a virus-producing factory. So it's safe to say that viruses are parasitic on cellular life? Yes, viruses are parasitic on, on cellular life. Is there then some sense in which viruses could not have come first? They needed cells around already to come into existence? Well, if they were the kinds of viruses we see today, then that would certainly be true. Uh, but we can imagine that there were other kinds of life forms uh, that might have degenerated into viruses, mm. but have been in an earlier stage of evolution uh, more self-sufficient. So there's a whole black box problem here. Uh, it, in what situation did viruses evolve? Uh, and it's very hard to know the answer to that. I presume we can't look at fossils of ancient viruses. Uh, that's right. We can't, or we haven't, we haven't been able to. I mean, for life, we have this idea that we can find features of a uh, last universal common ancestor, because all cellular life has certain genetic features in common. But my impression is that's not true for viruses. Viruses sometimes just kind of spring up without uh, having a common origin. No, all viruses have as their genetic material, DNA or RNA. Hmm. And so they are connected to the rest of, of the living world at a very fundamental level. We use the same genetic code Viruses use the same genetic code as as humans or uh, any other species does, and they are different than humans or 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 plants, uh, but they are not out of the blue. Okay, so there might be a last universal common virus ancestor. Uh, but I I don't think all viruses evolved from a universal precursor. I think that there have been multiple evolutions of viruses that don't have a common ancestor. 
And, and I say it that way because we don't actually know the answer, but the DNA viruses and the RNA viruses are really very different from one another. The bacterial viruses, uh, particularly the viruses that grow in marine bacteria or marine organisms, uh, are a very different set of critters than uh, the ones that cause human disease, for instance. And the plant, some of the plant viruses are very different than most animal viruses. So there are some common ancestors, but I suspect there are some really quite disparate evolutionary stories. Okay. Okay. That that don't have a common uh, don't have a common base. I mean, you mentioned uh, what I think is the most fascinating fact about the virus is that unlike cellular life, which basically you're the biologist here, correct me if I'm wrong. My impression is that all cellular life uh, contains its genetic information in a double strand of DNA, and it uses RNA to make proteins. And that's the central dogma of biology. But viruses are much more right. haphazard. Like some of them use DNA, some RNA, single strands, double strands, what have you. Well, I wouldn't call it haphazard. I would call it inventive. Mm hmm. Uh, Fair enough. Viruses have managed to use genetic information in ways that uh, higher cells don't. I mean, I guess the usual thing that I'm told is that RNA is a little bit more fragile than DNA, and therefore DNA makes a better repository for genetic information. Do viruses manage to uh, overcome that obstacle? Uh, they they overcome it largely by numbers. So when you get a a per, somebody's infected and they make new viruses, they're making literally billions of new viruses. Uh, so the fact that the if they have an RNA genome, that it is more chemically fragile, and it is, um, is overcome by numbers, I think. Okay. <laughs> and and it's not a, not a big problem. <laughs> so if, you, if a few viruses don't survive or don't uh, reproduce accurately, we'll just make more. That's the, that's the philosophy. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. And uh, do we think that the, I mean, ha so there's a lot of viruses out there. I mean, this is one of the things I read. The, the number of different kinds of viruses could be an order of magnitude larger than the number of kinds of species of all other life forms on Earth. And every organism contained many, many individual virus particles. So how do we even start to sort of... Uh, impose order on all of this variety to sort of classify what kinds of different viruses there are? Well, virologists have enjoyed themselves by going into the natural world, isolating viruses, uh, and then characterizing them in the electron microscope to get an idea of what their structure is, chemically to get an idea of their, their metabolism, uh, and then naming them. Uh, and so we have lots and lots of viruses, each with its own name. But we're not, I mean, we're never going to name them all, right? There's just too many different kinds. I, I think that's fair, that we, we will never name them all. Because basically every organism on Earth, every larger organism on Earth has viruses. Hmm. And there are even some viruses that have viruses. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> uh, yes. It's, it seems odd, um, but and it's it's actually a fairly recent discovery. But there's a class of megaviruses, which were discovered only in the last couple of decades, um, in in oceans mostly. And some of these megaviruses actually have parasitic viruses that grow on them. How how big does mega qualify as in this case? Well, there are viruses that are literally bigger than bacteria. Okay. So they have hundreds of genes. If they, I guess they have thousands of genes. They're just, but they still have to, are parasitic. They still okay. have to grow inside a cell because they can't do the two things I mentioned. They can't make proteins. They can't make energy. Right, right. Um, but they actually have some genes that help them make proteins. And 
they may even have elements of 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 energy production. So it's getting fuzzier and fuzzier that line between between viruses and all other organisms. So I used to be comfortable saying viruses were a separate kingdom, uh -huh. um, but uh, I'm not so comfortable with that anymore. Well, that was also the impression I was getting in my reading, that rather than fighting over whether or not viruses count as living organisms, maybe the lesson is that the boundary between living organisms and non-living things is just not so sharp. I mean, that there's a biosphere and viruses play an important role in it, but they bounce back and forth between cellular organisms. No, I think there is a very fundamental difference between living organisms and non-living organisms, and sorry, non-living matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and viruses are living matter in the sense that they can reproduce, they can evolve, and uh, and they are part of the DNA RNA world. And that's not true of rocks, and it's not true of of water, and it's not true of a whole lot of other things which are non-living. Right. They can change. So evolving is a, an interesting concept to try to think about, uh, but they, they don't have independent existence. Yeah, so they have the uh, information storage capability and, and uh, reproduction passing down their information to subsequent generations, but they don't have the engine all by themselves, right? I mean, in order to... Uh, to right. take free energy from the outside world and get going and do things, that's where they take advantage of the cells they embed themselves in. That's right. I mean, all, all organisms depend on the sun yep. as a source of energy. And for viruses, they get uh, into the sun's pipeline through being inside cells. Um, plants, for instance, sit out there in, in nature and soak up the rays of the sun directly. And we eat plants. Uh, sometimes we eat animals, which have, in fact, eaten plants. Yeah. So let's go into a little bit more detail about how the viruses affect the DNA of the cells that they go into. I mean, you mentioned it very, very briefly, but it's just a fascinating story in its richness. You know, the viruses themselves can have DNA or RNA, but like you say, they don't make proteins. They go in there and hijack. So maybe explain that a little bit more. Well, to make proteins requires something called a ribosome, which is a very complex little machine uh, that can decode the genetic code from um, DNA or RNA, actually from RNA directly, ne never from DNA. Right. Um, and can read that code as three base segments of, of, uh, the, of code uh, that code for, the, uh, for different amino acids being inserted into proteins. So proteins grow linearly and they grow one, two, three, four, five, each a different amino acid, sometimes multiple of the same amino acid. Um, and that whole process, which has to be exquisitely accurate, is, uh, is something that viruses simply don't have because they don't have ribosomes. Uh, and so they had to find ribosomes. But the, so they go in there, do they just take advantage of the ribosome in the cell? Or my impression is sometimes they'll change the DNA or insert themselves into the DNA or take pieces out of the DNA of the actual cell they're living in. Right. There are some times when viruses actually insert their, their own DNA into the DNA of the cell. And actually, that's how cancer-inducing viruses work because they become part of the cell's DNA. And now every time the cell divides, it carries the virus along to the next generation. Yeah. So, uh, and if it's inside a, let's say, a chicken, um, the chicken will grow a tumor. Uh, 
uh, which is a whole lot of cells, each one of which have these virus specified sequences in them, which cause the synthesis of specific proteins that now take over the cell. But that's not the only thing they can do. So there are ways that viruses can go in there and just use the ribosome by themselves without messing with the DNA yes. of the cell? Yes. Oh, okay. Most of the RNA viruses, for instance, go into the cytoplasm of the cell or the nucleus, the two, two compartments of the cell, and they just make more of themselves. And th part of what they make is messenger RNA that specifies particular proteins. So those hop onto the existing ribosomes. And often what the virus does is to interfere with the cell's messenger RNA so that the cell's messenger RNA can't get on ribosomes. That frees up the ribosomes so that the virus can take full advantage of it. <laughs> this was something that I worked out actually in my thesis oh my 60 goodness. years ago. Is it, uh, is it necessarily a hostile takeover or it can be just friendly coexistence? Uh, there are some that, that are friendly coexistence. Uh, generally, viruses that don't make much of themselves, that is, don't make large numbers of progeny. Viruses that do make large numbers of progeny try to overwhelm the cell and get rid of any... And, and the cell dies right. because the cell can no longer provide itself with what it needs. I mean, you made this wonderful distinction that was really clarifying to me about equilibrium viruses versus non-equilibrium viruses. Viruses that yeah. have sort of settled into coexistence with their hosts and viruses that are kind of new and untamed and can cause great damage. Right. And it, it, it's basically that if a virus is part of the ecosystem of uh, an animal, take a human, the virus evolves to be not too greedy hmm. so that it doesn't kill off its host. And the animal or human evolves to fight against the virus, to minimize the amount of virus that can be made. And they come into an equilibrium where the virus gets enough uh, handle on cells to make some of itself, but it doesn't, it doesn't ask for a whole lot. That's if the virus is completely dedicated to this one species. But if the virus is in other species, then it may, when it gets into humans, become voracious or become very meek because it hasn't evolved with humans. And those are the viruses that cause us trouble. It makes sense that viruses would, if they're parasitic on their hosts, they would evolve to be in some kind of relationship with them. I mean, when we find viruses out there in right. the wild, is it generally true that there is basically one or at least a small number of species that they're happy being hosted by? Uh, yes. In general, um, in fact, most viruses are pretty well dedicated to one species and have come into equilibrium with that species of animal or plant or whatever. Uh, and then it may infect a few others, or it may not. But these non-equilibrium things, the bad guys, are uh, very often coming to us human beings, for example, from other species. That, that's, a, that's a case where you jump from one to the other. A exactly. And so HIV is a virus that is native to monkeys. Uh, it doesn't cause serious disease in monkeys, but when it jumps to higher apes like chimpanzees or jumps to humans, then it causes havoc because it hasn't developed that modus vivendi. Yeah. And are, are the viruses ever not just parasitic, but symbiotic? Do they ever do something good for their hosts? Well, not much. <laughs> um, now, it's a, that's a sticky question. Uh, one thing that viruses do is kill their hosts. And in the case of, for instance, 
the bacteria in the ocean, what it does is to liberate the, the internal workings of the bacteria. So the ocean is a rich soup mm. because viruses are constantly killing off cells and breaking them open. Now, is that, is it good for the, it's, it's good for the oceans, <laughs> but is it really good for the bacteria? It's, uh, I don't think so. It's good for the many, but not good for the few, I think. Yeah. Uh, Something like that. Good for the right. ecosystem. Well, no, but, but that's very interesting. I mean, it, it's. Oh, I'm, it's good for the ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. And, that's right. and, ba- and viruses are a very important part of the overall ecosystem. Yeah, I think, you know, when I when I said that uh, the boundary between living and non-living might be fuzzy, I guess what I, what I'm what I was thinking of was that the boundary between an individual and the ecosystem might be fuzzy because of the kinds of things that viruses do, right? Like even if we agree that viruses are yeah. part of life with capital L, um, you know, they move from organism to organism. They they even if I think I like what you just said, they serve a purpose to biology even if not to the individual. And and th- that is the nature of the ecosystem. It's a system uh, with a lot of different moving parts. I mean, you mentioned cancer very briefly. I don't want to let that go by too quickly. Uh, how, like, is cancer always caused by viruses or often? Or is, are we still investigating that? Well, we are still investigating it. Um, but we think that the bulk of human cancer is not caused by viruses. Okay. Uh, and although people are still hunting around, seeing if there's things that we've missed, but the common cancers, lung cancer, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, whatever, uh, there's really no evidence for a virus involvement. Now, in head and neck cancer, there is a virus involvement. In cervical cancer, there is. And in animals, uh, there are many more cases of virus-induced cancer. So most virus-induced cancer is actually studied in animals. Is cancer even a coherent category? I mean, it's, it's some failure in the reproduction of individual cells, but are there enough commonalities between different kinds of cancer that it's a sensible way of thinking? Or is a viral cancer very different from a non-viral one? Well, if we go back in in history a little ways, we didn't know that viruses cause cancer. And we thought that cancer was a disease that was internal to an organism in some way. And when the first virus-induced cancers were discovered, people who were sensitive enough to numbers realized that Viruses were so small that the only thing they could be causing cancer with is genes. Ah. And so we began to study cancers from the point of view of what genes the viruses had, and we found cancer-inducing genes. Hmm. And then there was the amazing discovery of Varmus and Bishop that the cancer-inducing genes and viruses actually were mutated cellular genes. So it it brought everything back, it brought the cycle back, uh, and we realized that uh, cancer is induced by genes. Some are carried by viruses, some are endogenous to uh, the organism. So we get mutations of genes that cause lung cancer or that cause... Um, breast cancer, and no virus is involved. But in other species, breast cancer is caused by viruses. And it's even the same kinds of genes that are involved. It's that the viruses have picked up these genes and are carrying them along with them. That's the history of modern day cancer research. I've just sort of done it all in one Swoop. Yeah, no, that that was great. That was extremely clarifying. I mean, so is it safe to say cancer is some kind of genetic failure and viruses are one way to induce that? Yes. Good. I, I don't know about failure, 
I okay. mean, from our point of view, it's a failure. But <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to keep calling it a failure. I, I know what you mean. It's a, a, a something sure. changed. <laughs> But so uh, I, I want to get, get back. Uh, there's just too many interesting things to talk about here. But I don't think that uh, I've quite wrapped my brain around um, the ways in which the virus and the DNA of the host cell interact. Because I know that, you know, your big discovery for which you won the Nobel Prize was uh, a little footnote or a little emendation to the famous central dogma of biology. And maybe you could explain how that works. Right. So the, the central dogma... Um which was enunciated by Francis Crick uh, in the 1960s, maybe late 50s, was that DNA is the repository of genetic information for higher cells, for us and our brethren, um, that the way DNA controls the cell how the, inf the information flows is first by copying the DNA into RNA, and then the RNA working with ribosomes, synthesizing specific sets of proteins. And from the proteins, all of life, all of the variety of life, all of the variety of cells flows. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the simplest form of a dictum, DNA makes, makes RNA, makes protein. Right. Uh, and that was the central dogma. And Crick says, I never meant to say that it couldn't go back the other way from RNA to DNA. <laughs> what I did, what, what I said very strongly was it couldn't flow from protein back to RNA. Huh. So... What Howard Temin and I showed in 1970 was that information could flow backwards from RNA to DNA. And many people said we violated the central dogma. <laughs> or we showed the central dogma was wrong. But if you believe Francis Crick, and I believe Francis Crick, um, he had already taken that into account. So uh, I guess I have two questions. One is... Why is he so sure, or was he so sure, that uh, you couldn't go from proteins to RNA? Is there some structural barrier there? Yes, there's an enormous structural barrier because it's, it's literally a code in RNA that gets transferred into the structure of protein. Mm -hmm. So to go back into the code would take a very complicated machine. You just... You can't just go backwards uh, in the protein synthetic machinery. Got it. He also, Crick also postulated, and, and not long after it was shown, that there had to be an adapter that would adapt the code to the reality of proteins. And so he understood that there was a lot of complex machinery uh, that wasn't going to just reverse itself. It's like saying, if you want to, to take the plans for a house and make a house out of it, going back from the house, well, it wouldn't be so difficult. That was a bad example. <laughs> but there's, there must be a better one. The example I was going to use, because we just had uh, Scott Aronson on the podcast, who's a computer complexity theorist. It's easy to multiply yeah. two numbers to get a big number. It's hard to factor a big number back into its two uh, factors. Uh, well, all right. That's that's actually a, a good um, way of looking at it. But that, that kind of argument, yeah, doesn't seem to have an analog for going from RNA to DNA. Look, I mean, I'm, I know very little about this, but my feeling is that RNA is kind of like just a looser, more fragile version of DNA, but it's structurally very similar. Uh, that's exactly true. The difference between RNA and DNA is a couple of uh, chemical bonds. And people have long hypothesized that RNA came first and was exactly because it's a little bit less, a little bit less rigid, maybe it was easier to make the first time, and then RNA led both to proteins and DNA in modern life. Are, are you a fan of that uh, mm -hmm. RNA world no, kind of theory? I, I am a fan of the RNA world theory. 
uh, I think it's very likely that RNA came first, but uh, it's not so much because it's easier to make RNA than DNA. It, it isn't. It's because RNA uh, isn't a rigid rod. DNA is a, is a, this double helix that winds around itself and forms a long rod. RNA is generally just one strand, and so it it's wigglier, and it can do more. Yeah, okay. So actually today, uh, DNA looks like a dull molecule, and RNA looks much more interesting, does many more things, um, and you can, it's easier to imagine that the world had only RNA than that the world had, world had only DNA. DNA is a good place to secure information securely, as it were, to store it securely, but RNA right. is just more active and, and vibrant and out there in the world doing things. While at the same time, it can also store information right. just like DNA can. Right. There are double-strand DNA viruses, sorry, double-strand RNA viruses in which RNA acts exactly like DNA. And, I mean, maybe I didn't let you finish or where you got distracted from exactly how uh, the central dogma got amended in a way that would not offend Francis Crick. I mean, how is it that uh, viruses figure out how to go right. from RNA to DNA? Well, we don't know in an evolutionary sense how that came about. But what we do know is that there's a class of RNA viruses that carry with them in their in the virus particle an enzyme that can copy RNA into DNA. And that's what I showed and Howard Temin showed at the same time, and for which we won the Nobel Prize, was that the, the virus actually had the enzyme in it. And it's a virus-specified enzyme, so it's picked up in the previous replication cycle of the virus. And it copies the RNA into DNA uh, as the first thing it does when it gets inside a cell. Hmm. And then that DNA goes into the nucleus, which is where we keep DNA in our cells. And it breaks open randomly, more or less, the structure of the DNA and it literally inserts itself end to end into the cell's DNA. And now the cell inevitably for the rest of its life has this new genetic information in it. And it's insidious. <laughs> I mean, it sounds a little scary to think that that's going on in our bodies. You know, that, that does sound bad. Oh, yeah. These little guys are messing with our DNA. They're messing with our DNA. And we, they've been doing it for a long time. So something like 50% of our DNA originated as viruses. We're, we're carrying around in our cells all sorts of interesting little pieces of DNA that have origins totally outside of ourselves. Yeah, like that. Uh, so it's part of evolution, right? Like I think that there's a sort of high school version of evolution where you... You know, the, the cells break in two, and then there's sexual reproduction. Occasionally, there's a mutation. But the story of viruses really makes me think that it's much more open than that, right? Like the, the, the DNA strands mm -hmm. that mom and dad give us are not quite as sacrosanct as I was led to believe in my high school biology class. That's right. Um, and we, we call this DNA parasitic DNA uh, because it's taking advantage of the properties of DNA uh, in order to propagate an organism or a piece of an organism, which is a virus. It's hard to, uh, well, I, mean, I should say it the other way around. It's very tempting to anthropomorphize <laughs> these tiny little things, right? <laughs> I mean, Richard Dawkins famously wrote yeah. The Selfish Gene, and... Uh, I'm yes. not sure if you if you think that's a good metaphor, but it, it, it certainly does. There is a temptation to think that there's this, you know, competition slash cooperation, but a constant jostling inside our genomes be, 
between our genes and the viruses that want to tag along. Uh, yes, uh, th- there is all of that, and and it plays out over evolutionary time. So there are things in our genome that actually found their way into our genome in monkeys uh, or in actually earlier organisms um, and have been carried along ever since then uh, during the the millions of years of evolution uh, because it takes uh, a very, very long time to get rid of something once it's in your genome. <laughs> But we still, we draw these pictures, right, of, you know, the family trees of different species and, and families and genuses and so forth. And and that kind of picture is very compelling, but it hides the idea that, you know, there are viruses or, or other things. I don't know. Tell me if whether it's only viruses or there are other things that kind of insert DNA that did not come from our ancestors at all. No, I think only viruses do that. But yes, uh, we have... Uh, ignored uh, a source of genetic information which doesn't follow the usual rules. It comes in as an infectious source, um, and it's, it's very important. Does this count as what's called horizontal gene transfer? Yes, it is horizontal gene transfer, but uh, what we generally mean when we say horizontal gene transfer is that among bacteria, DNA from one bacterium can go to another bacterium Hmm. and be inserted. Uh, And that's something that really doesn't happen as far as we know in, in humans or in, in higher organisms in, in uh, multicellular organisms. Uh, So we never get little pieces of rabbit DNA or little pieces of, (laughs) <laughs> mouse DNA, uh, whereas bacteria do. They get little pieces of DNA from other bacteria. Well, I guess if some viruses can insert their DNA into us, and that can even be evolutionarily advantageous, and we can pass it down, uh, do we ever insert bits of our DNA into viruses, or do they ever swipe any from us? Uh, well, yes, they do. Particularly these megaviruses swipe lots of DNA from their host organisms and make make it part of them. Uh, most of the viruses that infect us are pretty small and really don't have room to bring in new genes. Hmm. So they're, they're pretty stable in terms of their uh, genetic complement. So poliovirus today looks just like poliovirus did uh, during earlier parts of the evolutionary tree. So, so the megaviruses um, infect other kinds of organisms? I mean, how do they survive? They do. They, they particularly infect something called a canth amoeba. It's a, a kind of amoeba that's, that is plentiful in the ocean. I, I think it's still a question, although maybe things have happened that I'm not aware of. Uh, it's still a question whether these megaviruses also infect other things yeah, in the ocean or out of the ocean. I don't know the answer to that. Even if it's unlikely, I kind of like to imagine the possibility that a virus could carry a little bit of gene from a rabbit to a human being. <laughs> I think that's something that biologists <laughs> should look into. <laughs> well, you know, we're now sequence, we're sequencing the genomes of all sorts of species. And so if that was going to happen on any reasonable scale, we would see it. Ah, okay. Are we looking? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're looking at the DNA. And whenever anybody sequences it, they they put it through computers that check whether the sequence has ever been seen before. Okay. All right. And so if there were <laughs> little bits of rabbit DNA in there, we, we would know it. But okay, good. So if I'm if I'm being more realistic rather than just hopeful, um, it's not so much horizontal gene transfer as just viruses being part of the ways in which different bits of DNA are altered or inserted into individual species, and that makes yeah. sense. That would that would play a role in evolution. Yes, and it's also true that 
the virus, the viruses, I mean, I, I shouldn't state this as a statement. I should ask it as a question. Um, is viral genetic information more fragile and therefore does it mutate more easily than cellular DNA information? No, chemically, there's no difference. Okay. Uh, viral information, cellular information, exactly the same DNA, all the same chemical bonds. The difference is that during the duplication of the genome, in cells, we have devoted a lot of attention to the precision of that duplication. And so the probability of an error creeping in is very low. And that's the reason that the number of mutations between me and my daughter are very, very small through yeah. the regions that, that she's inherited from me. So that, that process is exquisitely precise. For viruses, it's not so precise. Viruses, first of all, treasure speed rather than accuracy. And so <laughs> they don't want to spend all the time checking whether every bond is correct. Uh, they're willing to accept some genetic change. In fact, they may want some genetic change because they want to they want to uh, mutate and be able mm. to adapt to new circumstances through mutation. So viruses have set the bar for precision much lower than we do, than higher cells do. Yeah, okay, that makes and sense. And that difference is uh, something like five orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude. Oh, wow. I've forgotten exactly. So, yeah, okay. That, that does make sense. I, I, I just want to, um, I'm not quite sure we completely finished this wonderful story you're telling about uh, the reversal of the central dogma. So the, at the end of the day, we have <laughs> reverse transcription. Is that the, that the label for it? Yes, and it is. retroviruses are the viruses that do it? Is that, am I getting that correct? Right, right. They were named because they reversed the flow of information. And is an HIV is a retrovirus? It is. Okay. And so when we're, when we're moving from admiring the ingenuity of these little guys to fighting against them, uh, is it an entirely different game if we want to sort of um, battle against retroviruses versus... I don't know, proviruses? Well, I'm not quite sure what the opposite of a retrovirus is. Um, it's, it's all other viruses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and yes, we do uh, fight against them in different ways. And in particular, the reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that copies RNA to DNA, uh, is a target for drugs. Mm. And uh, very early on, when, when uh, after HIV was discovered, we had on the shelf drugs, pharmaceutical companies had on the shelf drugs that could selectively uh, attack reverse transcriptase. Uh, and that was the reason that uh, we had drugs to fight AIDS within about, what, five years of the discovery. Hmm. Uh, because there were on the shelf these of uh, uh, drugs that selectively, it, uh, it turned out, inhibited this, this polymerase. And then we made many more of them because that one was so successful, but it wasn't enough. Uh, and it's been a, a, a huge successful story of chemical synthesis of inhibitors of reverse transcriptase and some other proteins of the virus. Uh, okay. that's enabled us to control HIV and to control AIDS. And maybe let's, it'd be good now to be clear um, for the non-experts, there are different ways of fighting against these viruses. So there's, you know, the drug treatments that you're talking about, but there's also vaccines, which are different things, different beasts. That's right. So the vaccines are a way of stimulating our immune system so that it will fight against a virus and that's a very different process than chemically uh, interfering with the growth of a virus. 
as you, as you were saying. So vaccines are a totally different beast. Yeah. Right. The drugs that you mentioned are literally just chemicals that go in there and get in the way. Is that correct? Right. But the vaccines are much subtler. Right. So what we do is, is to make something that looks to the immune system like a virus, but doesn't cause disease. Mm-hmm. And then we give that to people and people react to it by making antibodies against the virus because the immune system thinks it's seen a virus. And then if we get a real virus infection, the system is all set up and ready to go. And it uh, reacts much faster than if it hadn't seen the surrogate virus, the, the, the vaccine. Uh, and it reacts so fast that generally we don't even know that a virus has entered our bodies. Yeah. Um, and it, it gets rid of them and, and we're fine. And what is the trick in designing such a vaccine? Is it making sure that the right antibodies are created? Well, yes, but we were making vaccines before we knew about antibodies. So Jenner made the first vaccines or understood the first vaccines. And that was cowpox injected into humans so that um, a human would th- think they'd seen smallpox. But in fact, they'd seen something much less dangerous than smallpox. But the immune system now was all prepared to fight off smallpox. And that was very effective. I guess what I'm getting at is, is our immune system always clever enough to fight if it's been prepared? Or do we have to sort of prepare it in different ways? Are are we teaching the immune system what antibody to make? Or are we just spurring it to do something that it would have done by itself given enough time? Well, it would have done it on... uh, by itself, given it enough time. That's true. But during that time, you could be god-awful sick yeah. <laughs> and might die. Right. Uh, and so time is of the essence. But So I guess what I'm not quite understanding is, um, is our immune system more clever than we are in the sense that it knows how to make an antibody that would fight this particular virus? Well, our immune system is part of us. Uh, It can't be smarter than we are. Uh, (laughs) Smarter than our uh, forebrains. But the uh, immune system uh, reacts to any foreign protein by making antibodies that will bind to it. And that foreign protein may be a virus or it may be something else. Hmm. And the immune system is evolved as a very general way of recognizing foreign protein sequence. And if it sees foreign protein sequence, it reacts to it. So it's a very general capability. When we're trying, for example, to get a virus for the, uh, a, a vaccine for the coronavirus. Um, right. I mean, what, what is the intellectual challenge there? What, what are the puzzles that we have to solve to make that happen? So in principle, all we should have to do is to make a preparation of the coronavirus inactivate its ability to do to multiply, hmm. which we can do chemically, and then inject that, and the protein should act as what we call an immunogen to stimulate the immune system to make antibodies. And some vaccines are as simple as that. They're just killed virus. The Salk vaccine famously, was killed poliovirus. But that doesn't always work. Sometimes in the process of killing the virus, you also kill the protein's uh, ability to stimulate immune, an immune response. Uh, lots of things can go wrong in the way, along the way. So the um, Chinese actually have made a vaccine that way. And they're trying to prove that that vaccine will actually protect people. Uh, And we'll see it. They showed that it would protect monkeys. But you can also just take 
the spike from the surface of the virus, which is a protein, mm -hmm. and use that. And that's ah. much simpler. So you can make that totally synthetically. It's cheaper to make. You can control the manufacture better. And so that's something that many companies and, and labs are focusing on right now as a way of inducing antibodies. And we'll see if it works. But uh, the, the problem is it doesn't always work. We've, we've got lots of history of failed attempts to do this with other viruses. And more insidiously, sometimes it makes the infection worse rather than better. It actually helps the virus get into cells. Yeah, okay. Uh, and so you don't want that. So you got to be sure <laughs> that the vaccine doesn't do that. Uh, and that's part of proving that your vaccine is safe. But yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, we still don't have a vaccine for something like HIV, right? Or the common cold, for that matter. There's no guarantee we just sort of solve this problem on a short time scale. Yes, but the reasons that we don't have a vaccine against HIV are idiosyncratic to HIV. Okay. For reasons that I'm, I'm not going to try to explain. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it, it is, it's, it's a fascinating story about how HIV has evolved to avoid the immune system. Uh, and so when we're trying to make a vaccine, we're trying to do something which never happens naturally. And we're still trying to make that happen. The common cold is a different story. So the common cold is more than one kind of virus. Uh, there are viruses from different species of viruses that all cause the, more or less the same symptoms, uh, which is what we call a common cold. Uh, many of them are of a class of viruses called rhinoviruses, rhino being for the nose. Um, mm. And they all cause sniffles and coughs and whatever. But there are literally hundreds of them uh, just in humans. Uh, there are uh, coronaviruses that cause a common cold. There oh. are adenoviruses that cause the common cold. So there are DNA viruses, there are RNA viruses. Um, so the common cold is not something that we can make a vaccine against because it's so has so much variety. Okay, that actually makes sense. But so therefore you're saying that maybe I should not be quite so pessimistic about coronavirus. The coronavirus they're cur we're currently, the novel one that we're currently fighting against, are you optimistic that we will get a vaccine at some point? I am optimistic. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to get a vaccine. It only means that I'm optimistic. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I'm sort of an optimist. Uh, but uh, it looks to me like this is a pretty ordinary virus. Um, and against most ordinary viruses, we have been able to make vaccines. So we have vaccines against measles, mumps, chicken pox, never mind things like smallpox. Uh, and polio. And so I'm reasonably confident that there okay. is, we'll find a way to make a vaccine within the next couple of years. Okay. And what, I mean, what do we do if it, let's say it takes two years, uh, are, yeah. is it there, are there prospects for treatments that will let us go back to something like normal in the meantime, or are we going to have to maintain quasi lockdown indefinitely until a vaccine comes along? I don't see us making a chemical inhibitor, a drug, against uh, COVID-19 uh, in any less than a couple of years. So okay. it's, it's the same sort of problem. Uh, we could be lucky. And w people are trying very hard to be lucky um, and to find a drug which we already know is safe and you, we use for something, uh, but also will inhibit uh, the coronavirus. Right. And we, we hope that that something exists, but uh, there's no actual reason why it should. I mean, remember, viruses have their own evolutionary history. And so their proteins don't look anything like our ordinary proteins, the proteins of our body. 
Yeah. Uh, that makes them terrific targets for the immune system because they are so different, but it makes them very unlikely to do the same things as our cells do. And so we won't likely have made drugs against them. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in favor of being lucky, but I think that it's also important to at least conceptualize the pessimist, pessimistic scenario. And so I, what I hear you saying is right. it's at least something we should be prepared for, the idea that, you know, we don't get any medicine for this for the next two years. And we have to right. be we have to combat it in uh, more primitive, I guess, ways. So l let me get on my high horse for a minute. Please. That's why we're here. <laughs> we ought to have in our armamentarium drugs that will inhibit the growth of coronaviruses. All coronaviruses are related to each other. They all do basically the same set of things. I would think that the pharmaceutical industry, given enough time and, and money, could make drugs against coronavirus. And they wouldn't have to know which coronavirus it was hmm. in order to have inhibitory molecules. But we never spent any time trying to do that. We never gave the natural world credit for what it could produce that would cause a human pandemic. And we should do that. And we should dedicate ourselves now, even though it's late for this, for COVID-19. For COVID-20 and 21 and 22, <laughs> it's not too late. Uh, and we should be now dedicating ourselves to never be caught like this again. Dare I ask, are we dedicating ourselves to that? <laughs> not that I've seen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and as but long as we depend on, as long as we depend on the profit motive... Right. Uh, we're not going to because profit motive doesn't know which one is worth making. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But we do have research labs, government research labs, and universities that are not completely profit motive, motive driven. Right. Right. So there's some prospect. And we have to we'll find a way to, to, to we have to find a way to fund them, to incentivize yeah. them, to make it. You know, we got to have put up prizes, whatever it takes. Yep. Okay. Uh, That's good. And we it's an and it's item. not just coronaviruses. Uh, the same thing is true for a whole range of other viruses. Well, this is one of the questions I wanted to sort of uh, start winding up with. Um, what does the future of pandemics look like to you? I mean, is this just the shape of things to come or is this a weird outlier? I mean, in some sense, the fatality rate is around 1% and, uh, you know, it's asymptomatic for a couple of weeks. But if there's a virus that is asymptomatic for a month, and has a fatality rate of 50%, then we are in trouble, right? Right. I think most people feel, epidemiologists feel, that this is not an outlier. That we should be, have, we should have expected this. We were given warning with SARS and MERS mm -hmm. that coronaviruses had the ability to appear in new forms that we were not aware of were out there in the world. We should go in and and characterize every virus in a bat because bats seem to be a very effective uh, reservoir for viruses that can get into humans. But we, it's not just bats. The whole natural mm -hmm. world uh, has viruses that we have to worry about. Uh, and so we ought to be cataloging them. We ought to be doling out to individual companies the responsibility to make sure that we can inhibit them. We should take all this seriously. Now, will yeah. we? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know because... The, it's been this has been known for years yeah uh, this is public health yeah. and the history of public health is that when something stops being a an eminent problem that we lose our focus on it 
and we start using our resources for other things. Uh, and this ought to be the lesson of lessons, that we can't do that. We have to keep our eye on the ball. And the ball is that whole world of potential viruses. Right. I, I, I will take this as uh, on the optimistic side of the ledger, because as many as our public health failures have been, what you're what you're saying is realistic. We could do it. It's just up to us. It's not like there's an insuperable yes. scientific problem here. It's just a matter of willpower, right? Right. Oh, and, and money. probably <laughs> willpower and money, political will. Yeah, that that's right. And probably yeah. for right. uh, dramatic tension reasons, we should end there. But I'm not going to let you go yet because because I have you here. I'm going to give you two lightning round questions. Um, okay. One is one is. Uh, You've been you've been active at least speaking out on the idea of gene editing and human gene editing. Uh, this is you know yes. we haven't talked about it during this podcast, but it's obviously a big deal for science, biology, humanity right now. Uh, how should the people out there be thinking about the prospects and the dangers of gene editing in your view? I, I think if we're going to use the strength that gene editing gives us to modify human heredity. The place where it seems to me it's all good and no bad is with certain kinds of diseases uh, that are in our genome and that are inherited in families. Um, and that if we could get into those families, mm -hmm. uh, into their genes and modify them so that they don't pass Huntington's disease, they don't pass sickle cell anemia, they don't pass the many other thousands, literally, of uh, diseases that we now pass around in, in among humans. That that would be a good thing for the human race. Right now, there are some arguments about it, and I've I've heard them, but I, I'm going to ignore them at least for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, the problem is that if we do that, do we open a Pandora's box and provide yeah. the opportunity to not change genes that are bad, but to change genes that are cosmetically less than exactly what we would want? Mm -hmm. So some people would like to have children who are very intelligent. Now, I don't know what very intelligent means. I don't know how you measure it, and there are a whole lot of problems with it. But if we knew that it was attached to specific genes, you could say, I want to get that gene into my inheritance. I yeah. want my children to have it. Or a gene for, for height, or a gene for... Uh, now, there are some things that are at the borderline. For instance, obesity is something which we can control, uh, but which also has a genetic component um, yeah. and, and other things. So it's, I know it's not simple nope. uh, to make that <laughs> distinction, but let's say it were simple to make the distinction, then we'd have to say, can we control what this technology is used for so that it's used for the right things and not the wrong things? That's a huge challenge to the modern world uh, because we don't have the international law, the international treaties, so that everybody in the world will behave in a common way. Uh, and that means that if you can't get it done in the United States, you might be able to get it done somewhere else. And so we are now wrestling with these issues, the issues of where are, the, where are the lines to be drawn? What do we want to allow? What don't we want to allow? How are we going to make common cause across the world? And I realized that this was going to happen about, oh, six or eight years ago, when the first intimations of, of this technology became known. Uh, and I said we had to prepare the world to think for, think about these problems. And so I helped organize uh, now two meetings 
uh, one in Washington, one in Hong Kong, that brought together people from around the world to begin to think about this. I didn't think that we were going to generate answers, and we didn't. Uh, but I think we did generate consciousness. Uh, we did generate concern. And there will be another such meeting in a year or two, as soon as we can have meetings again. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so far, there has been only one attempt to do this in humans. Uh, it was a f sort of badly designed attempt by a Chinese scientist um, who has been appropriately uh, stripped of his academic positions in China. Right. And I, w I hope we keep talking and we don't see any more attempts to, to put it into practice. Uh, but I feel that, that it is a technology which can benefit our species uh, and that we ought to find a way to get the good and to control the use of it in, in ways that are less appropriate. Good. That's that's very useful. And uh, I mean, I can follow up, obviously, but I'm, uh, but your your time is valuable. And I will ask you one more lightning round question. I was very uh, slightly surprised when I read an interview with you from a few years ago. It contained the following quote from you. The most interesting, outstanding biological question is the origin of consciousness. I'm not going to argue yes. with that, but that seems uh, interesting coming from a virologist. Uh, how Do you still believe that is true? I do still believe that's true. And we haven't made much uh, of a dent in it, although we've made a little dent in it. But why it comes from a virologist is because I have another side to my life, uh, which is that I love institutions. I honor what institutions do. And I have been willing to give over some of my time and energy to running institutions. And so right. I was president of the Rockefeller University. I was president of Caltech. And I have been involved in uh, a whole variety of, of uh, things that relate to the infrastructure of science rather than the doing of experimental science. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that I have had an opportunity to look at the widest range of science and to think about uh, what are the real challenges in science um, and what does it take to build institutions that can meet those challenges. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that neuroscience was the future and that we have, in spite of working on neuroscience problems for many generations now, we still have a long way to go to understand how the brain works um, and how it controls our behavior. And that within that, the most enigmatic piece of it is consciousness. How do we, uh, I mean, I, I've got consciousness of the room in front of me uh, of uh, the machines in front of me. I can tell you all about it. Uh, <laughs> but how do I do it? How do I um, make the images out of biology, out of neurons? Yeah. That seems like such a jump. I mean, the jump from DNA to protein was an amazing one. The jump from neurons to consciousness is I think orders of magnitude more challenging to think about. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, David Baltimore, yeah. thanks so much for being okay. on the Mindscape Podcast. My pleasure. 